Hi, I'm Paul Mundy, the annual conference moderator, and I'd like to warmly welcome you to our second virtual denominational worship gathering. As we gather tonight, we're challenged by an adventuresome theme to venture forth boldly in spite of our current challenging circumstance, expectant and innovative, serving the God who makes all things new. I have two announcements as we enter into worship. First, this summer's annual conference will be online rather than in person to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Worship services, business sessions, insight sessions, and networking groups will all be available online, as well as a concert by Fernando Ortega, daily Bible studies by Dr. Michael Gorman, and a special session led by Todd Bolsinger, the author of Canoeing the Mountain. We hope that you'll register for the online annual conference beginning March 2nd. Second, later in this worship, there will be an offering to be divided equally between emergency disaster response and annual conference. Annual conference relies on registration income and district fees for all of its budget. This past year, because of the cancellation of annual conference, the annual conference budget is in need of additional resources. Emergency Disaster Fund receives much of its funding from disaster auctions, many of which were canceled or modified in the past year because of the pandemic. We hope that you'll be generous in the offering time provided later in this worship service. Hello to our siblings in the faith throughout the Church of the Brethren. My name is Cindy Laprade Latimer. And I am Ben Latimer. It is wonderful to welcome you into this time and space for worship. We are co-pastors of the Stone Church of the Brethren in Huntingdon, Pennsylvania, and have the unusual yet joyful privilege to serve as your worship leaders in this time. And while we wish we were welcoming you into our beautiful sanctuary, we are welcoming you instead into our home. Just as you are welcoming us into your home right now. We are joining you from our living room where we have been leading worship for almost a year. In that time, we have come to realize more fully how important space is, especially for worship. And so as we begin, we invite you to take a moment to create a worshipful space with us and within us. Perhaps light a candle if you have one as a way to share space together, a symbol of God's presence among us, within each of us, with all of us. Our theme for our time together comes from our compelling vision materials, calling us to venture forth boldly as a faith family, expectant and innovative, serving others and the God who makes all things new. Let us blend our hearts together and with the Spirit of God, alive and at work with and in us. Family of God, Christ's light shines into all the nooks and crannies of our lives, exposing our fears, our faith, our pride, and our longing for justice and community. It shines on all that hides and thrives in our hearts, and in the world. Christ's light brings out into the open all that God can do, all that we might partner together in, a wild and wonderful vision of community and love, of service and salvation, of abundance, peace, and grace. So that we may more fully see and boldly dream and openly imagine and honestly love and truly live. Let us pray. Awaken us, O Christ, 
Shine your light on all that has left us numb or nostalgic. Reveal our apathy and indifference. Illuminate our hidden motives and desires. Enliven us, O Christ. Shine your light on the ties that still bind us to one another. Reveal our tender hope and vulnerable reaching out. Illuminate our creative wonderings and honest service. Empower us, O Christ. Shine your light in and through us. Reveal your Spirit's movement all around. Illuminate our shared path to renewal in your powerful love. Amen. Amen. Please join us in singing Awake, O Sleeper. from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. He shall give Children of the light and 
invite any children who may be joining with us to gather in close to the screen so that you can see and hear as our family shares with you. These are our kids, Everett, Ezra, and Cyrus. And we are all glad to be together with you. This has been a really strange year, hasn't it? Lots of things have been different. What are some of the things that have been different for you? What, what do you think, guys? What are some things? Um, school. I don't like to go to school at school. Yeah, oh. school has been really different this year. We don't get to travel that much, and I love to travel. What else? Mm -hmm. school, That's a good one. I really hate online school. <laughs> That's <laughs> true, too. We don't hard. get to see our grandparents. Yeah. yeah. Are there any of the things that have been different this year that are good? Changes that you've liked? We get to go to church with a whole bunch of other people. The rest of school, that's not quiet time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like what, who are some of the people that you're getting to go to church with now that we're on online for church? Hmm. Uh, well, we get to go with Granny and Papa and Nana and Granddaddy and Super Cool Aunt, commonly known as Aunt Beverly. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it funny that even during hard times, even during dark times, there are still things that we can find that are good. In some ways, the pandemic has showed us some very, some things that we were missing. Things we didn't even know that we were missing. Think of it like this. Can you boys see everything when the sun is shining? Everything that's right where I'm looking. Yeah, you yeah, can see a lot of things when the sun is a shining. a pretty long distance. Yeah. What about when the sun is shining right in your eyes? No. <laughs> no, you can't see anything then. What about the moon and the stars? Can you see those when the sun is shining? No. Yeah. In order to see the moon clearly, we need for the light to come to us differently than it does in the daytime. In just a minute, we're going to hear a scripture about how the Spirit of God keeps on revealing the light of God. Over and over, the light of God keeps shining out in the darkness, showing us new things, causing us to keep growing and changing. So even in this dark time, we can trust that God is still at work, that the Spirit will keep showing us new things and helping us to see things differently. Now, we're going to pray together, and in our church, we repeat the prayer together. So all of you can join us by repeating after me. Dear God, Dear, dear, God, dear God, thank you for your light. Thank, thank you, you for, for your, your light. light. Thank you for your light. Help us to see your love. Help, Help us, us to see your love. Even in dark times. Even, Even in dark, dark times. times. And help us. And help us. To be your love always. To be, to be your love always. always. Amen. Amen. One of the bright lights of the Church of the Brethren is its diversity of gifts. And we are excited to share with you a gift from the Haitian First Church in Miami.
no one's ever seen or heard anything like this. Never so much as imagined anything quite like it. What God has arranged for those who love God, but you've seen and heard it. Because God by the Spirit has brought it all out into the open before you. The Spirit, not content to flit around on the surface, dives into the depths of God and brings out what God planned all along. Why did you choose your church, your home congregation? Was it the people there, how they welcomed you? Was it the worship services, the music, the sermons, the community sharing of joys and concerns, the time for prayer, the opportunities for youth activities or volunteer work? Did you choose your church because it was a church of the brethren? Was it for the values of the denomination continuing the work of Jesus peacefully, simply together? Was it for the value of the fellowship and priesthood of all believers? That every one of us has spiritual insight, important to the growth of the faith family? In the early church, the 19th century church, the brethren ministers would even sit behind tables on the same level as congregation members. So there was no sense that the preachers knew all or that the congregation members had nothing to contribute. That is why I am so glad to be on a screen today for many of you who may be sitting in front of your computer screens, we are on the same level right now, a community of believers. Paul writes that we are all, as people who love God, invited to see and hear this spiritual witness. Within the faith family, we all see our own pieces of the puzzle of the mystery of God. Puzzles have unique pieces, all with a specific place they fit into the whole, each important and necessary to complete the picture. True, within the puzzle, there are many pieces that do not fit together, whole sections that won't match up, that seem disconnected from the others. In order to complete the puzzle and reveal the true and full picture of God's mystery, we must find a way to join all the pieces together, even the ones that seem so separate from one another, to learn all we can from each other, to leave no spiritual witness unheard. I remember one year that my sister Tani and I spent home for the summer in a house with no air conditioning. Now this was a summer in North Carolina, quite a bit different than the summers I have experienced in Indiana. It would get so hot and so humid that the only place that was not insufferable was in the basement. There was, however, no cell phone signal in the basement. I was a teenager and it was my first summer with a boyfriend. Needless to say, I suffered upstairs. But Tani would spend her hours down in the basement doing one of the most enjoyable digital free pastimes, putting puzzles together. Now, there are only so many times you can put puzzles together over the course of an entire summer before you pretty much know where every piece goes. So by the end of the summer, not to be discouraged, Tani took to flipping her puzzles over and completing them upside down. So she was just going by the shape of the puzzle pieces. To me, it seemed nearly impossible, since they were all just plain cardboard color. But she'd done the puzzle so many times before and knew that they all fit together to create the bigger picture on the other side, so she always found a way. When we turn our puzzle pieces upside down, we see that we are all believers in God. We are all united in our love for God. 
beyond our varying perspectives and life experiences. We see this in the example and teachings of Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of Luke, the 10th chapter, Jesus tells the parable of the wounded man who is passed by a priest and a Levite before being helped by a Samaritan. Jesus teaches the Samaritan was a good man because of his compassion rather than his alignment with a particular group or way of thinking. Further, in the fourth chapter of John, when Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at the well, he tells her that regardless of how she has been living or her association as a Samaritan, she is invited to drink the living water he has to give. We all possess knowledge of parts of God's mystery, and to fully understand the mystery, we must become known to each other. Being on screens can never take the place of physical presence, of sitting in an auditorium at annual conference with thousands of voices surrounding us, all singing praise together. That is truly magnificent worship. Being on screens can never take the place of kneeling to wash the feet of someone you have never met, kneeling in vulnerable service to say in that single act, I know nothing about you other than we believe, love, and serve the same God, so I will love and serve you. Yet we have been tasked with a new adventure by God. Just by being here now, you are supporting and participating in this adventurous movement. Annual conference is going to be online this year, so we can all attend, and not just us, but all the Church of the Brethren, even those who are not watching this video now. We have not had an opportunity like this as a church in centuries to all come together and worship, to share our spiritual witness with one another, and to see new pieces of God's mystery revealed through those who love God. Even right now, churches can do video groups where members who would have stood across the room from one another during the refreshment time before Sunday school are sharing in discussion with each other. Video Bible studies and Sunday school groups are now able to include interested members from neighboring congregations or congregations across the country or even across the world. Many churches continue to put their worship services online so we can now share in one another's worship. There are opportunities for outreach with members across the country through Brother and Volunteer Services. There's Messenger Magazine, denominational podcasts, and email newsletters. If you don't get any of those, I encourage you to do so. Not only to read them and to listen to them, but to contribute. Send in your own articles. Share your spiritual journeys. How many other new ways of knowing one another have we just not explored yet? We are called to share our own unique spiritual witness with the fellowship of believers and to listen to as many others share theirs as possible to understand how all our witnesses fit together into the greater picture that only God sees. Thank you, Audrey. The God who makes all things new was the theme of last fall's Shenandoah District Conference. Brethren musician Leah Heilman put that sentiment into music. Sun is dawning as night gives way to day. 
I can make all things. My peace I leave with you that the world can take away. I can make all things. Timeless and true is the path I have laid. Walk in your faith with all hope. For I say, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I can do all things. I can do all things. I am creator and redeemer more than you can see. I can make all things. I can make all things, all things new. All things new. The church continues to discover how God makes all things new, truly. We discover this in the midst of the challenges we face, particularly the challenges of virtual worship. Our moderator-elect, David Sollenberger, has been exploring this topic for us. It seems like years ago when this scene was common in our churches, folks gathering together, standing next to each other. Now in many congregations, this has been replaced by this, worship by remote control, communicating through the camera and the computer to the congregation. The Brethren.org website lists dozens of congregations who are either live streaming their services on Facebook or YouTube or offering them for later viewing online. For people who, as Anabaptists, have valued the importance of community, how has online worship impacted us? It absolutely is community, and it's absolutely a new kind of community, and that's what we have to be thinking about. I think it's community in the sense that whenever two or more are gathered, in the name of Jesus Christ, the presence of Jesus Christ is there with us. That spirit holds us, no matter where we are or how we are or who we are. There is Christ, and we are therefore Christ's body, Christ's community. 
The advantages of worship online have been touted for years, most effectively by a Church of the Brethren congregation that exists only online. You can connect with people across a distance. You can connect with people who can't leave their homes. It's a lower barrier to enter. It is easier to, to click and watch something. You can have your camera off, or um, if you're doing Zoom or in our you know, live stream, video stream, you don't, nobody's going to see you anyway. You can be more anonymous to try things out. Livingstream offers a service through their platform Sunday evenings that is attended by people literally around the world who connect through the service and the chat feature that allows for interaction. And they have a chat off to the side and you can tell that people are happy to see each other even though it's virtual. Mary was not Church of the Brethren before connecting with Livingstream but found the community she was seeking. I turned into the church and oh wow this is not old timey old-fashioned, you know, this is heartfelt. Everyone's so nice. But of course, I couldn't know all of that the first time. But no, I just felt like, this is good. I like these people. And I like the music and the message. And I just liked it. And plus, I was sort of anonymous, you know. The concept of a virtual church, especially within the Church of the Brethren, had been viewed with some suspicion. But this year changed all that. I spent a lot of time talking to people, not trying to convert anyone to say that this is better or the only way we should worship, but that it was an option that we should have available for Church of the Brethren. And I had a lot of conversations about that. Now, fast forward seven years, when everyone is doing worship online, everyone understands this immediately. It took two weeks to teach what I had spent two years trying to um, get people on board with. For most congregations, doing worship online has provided new opportunities for members of the congregation to be involved. Members can contribute elements to the service. We also have opportunities to see people in houses, to share their camera view of things, or even to physically share household members and pets in their homes and gardens that we normally wouldn't view. But there are also disadvantages. Not everyone has access to a computer. The human interaction of an embrace or shaking hands is missing. Singing is so much better when you're together than when you're trying to do it online. Um, there's not, you know, you can't, you have to be able to sit down around a table and eat together. There's just some things that you can't replicate online. For people who are as concerned as we are with the well-being of one another and our neighbors, not being in the presence physically of one another and our neighbors um, is a great challenge to our faith, to our ways of being in the world. We've been without those large gatherings, times of fellowship at district and annual conferences, disaster auctions and other fundraising events, the sound of congregational singing. But Dawn says that does not mean we can't take a casserole to someone who's grieving or provide material resources for those in need. Anton Eller, who's been behind the computer for many online services, was asked whether online interaction waters down our traditional understanding of community. Your question leads me to think that community is defined only in face-to-face -face terms, and what we've seen with social media is that people are already finding more meaningful community sometimes in other ways. I don't think we'll ever be able to replace the face-to-face, person-to-person um, sort of connections. But don't discount that real community actually happens in other ways as well. God's Spirit isn't limited to simply face-to-face -face connections. The Spirit can move across distances, can move hearts in different ways. This is another way to connect with people that for some people will be more important than others. Anton's congregation in Pennsylvania, like many others around the country, has seen people who have moved away from the area reconnect with the congregation online, or even discovering it for the first time. We've had people during the pandemic while we've been doing worship online that had never attended before, and through the invitation of someone else or just finding us, have started to participate. Um, enough that they're interested in pursuing at least an explorer's class to learn more, and some of them may choose to become members. The face of worship is clearly changing, but Donna Tony Wilhelm says as long as we keep Jesus the focal point of worship instead of on-screen personalities, and as long as a variety of participants are involved in the worship service, we can honor both our Anabaptist and our Pietist heritage. And online worship can be an additional mission tool for congregations. And this goes back to the roots of 
are we following Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. who never sought to be the star, who was reluctant to even call himself Messiah until he was pressed to do so, who chose again and again and again to call forth others to be followers in the way, and called forth others to participate in the kingdom of God and the reign of God among us. And that's exactly what we need to think about now. How do we now call forth one another and others? How do we welcome and host others in new ways, just as Jesus did continually? There's no doubt that this is gonna change who we are. And it's up to us to discern and to consider, and to pray and to work on who we will be. So what will worship look like beyond the pandemic? This online, which is new to most congregations, probably will never be able to be, you know, stuffed back into its bottle. Because what research is showing is that people want that flexibility to be able to connect in those ways. That's how a lot of their social life has already moved. So that's where they're looking for connection with church as well. So while we will be able to reclaim some of our worship forms as we move back into our buildings, we don't want to completely leave the online worship, the streaming worship behind because there are people that are going to be looking for connection to the church there. And if we really want to be able to minister to the people that are coming, looking for church, looking for Jesus, looking for their faith connections, looking for a place to express their spirituality, we're going to have to meet them in, on that plane as well. As congregations gradually move back into their buildings for worship, even while continuing live streaming, one thing we all have to do is to expect the unexpected, both unexpected challenges and unexpected opportunities. No one at the Circle of Peace congregation in Arizona could have possibly expected the response when they started holding services outdoors. Now you can do that in the wintertime in Arizona. But what they found was that since they started outdoor worship in November, upwards of 30 new families saw them gathering in front of their church on Sunday morning and decided to check them out, including one of their neighbors, Francie, who had actually discovered the church when it was only online and started attending when they began meeting in the front yard. I loved Jeremy's messages. Um, I liked the music too, um, and the people were very friendly. Francie immediately got involved in a fundraising project of the church to gather food and supplies for families they knew on the nearby Navajo Nation. I really appreciate that. I really do, because they care about others. When I saw the, that uh, the church was doing that, I just wanted to be involved with it. In fact, she's decided she wants to join the church, even though she's never even been inside the building. I'm not looking at the church inside of the church. I'm looking at what I see and what I see from Jeremy and the, and the whole congregation. I like it. It's good. Pastor Jeremy Ashworth says their outdoor worship and their online presence have really become evangelism tools to reach people who would not have taken the risk of coming inside. It was our heart. It was our hope from the beginning of outdoor church that this would be not only an opportunity for the insiders to regather, but an opportunity for the outsiders to become insiders. So would that be the case with evangelism? Somebody who would give Jesus a shot, that was our heart. Would it be the case for people who are maybe already believers but didn't have a church home? Would they give our church a shot? That has been our heart, that's been our hope, and the answer so far is yes. That's exactly uh, what has happened. The ways that people are joining congregations continues to evolve. And the ways that congregations are responding to the needs in our communities is also ever-changing. Here are a couple of examples from our siblings in faith. When you flip the first N and G in the word singing, the new word becomes signing. For the Buena Vista Stone Congregation, this simple change has brought about a very meaningful and powerful solution to a dilemma. There was a dilemma because uh, at that time uh, it was, we were reading articles about it not being safe during this time of COVID-19 to sing. And so we thought, well, how do we continue our worship uh, and, and worship the Lord without singing? And so then 
this idea of American Sign Language came into play because my daughter is taking classes in American Sign Language and she said, Dad, I'll, I'll be willing to, to help out. What happened was the night before, a couple nights before church, um, Dad, I would teach the signs to Dad. Um, he'd give me the song and I'd teach him the signs. And then um, on Sunday, he, initially, he would be the one teaching the congregation and they were, I picked it up really easy. And so that is what we have been doing ever since we uh, resumed in-person worship on the 31st of May. We have been doing some of the singing in American Sign Language. It is a new experience and people, some of them maybe are not as used to it, but they have really leaned into it and become comfortable with it because they know this is another way to express their praise and worship to God. It has really been a, a great uh, innovative way to be able to express ourselves, to be able to worship here at Stone Church. Uh, I serve occasionally as worship leader and it's just a beautiful thing to stand up front looking at the congregation and observe the, the folks in the con congregation participating. When you look up on the screen and you see the words and you have those words in your heart and you want them to go forward, using your hands is a wonderful way to express your worship for our Lord and Savior. And the congregation fits in well. They have adapted well to it and love it. So when you have a mask over your mouth and you can't sing out what's in your heart, your hands do the job for you. I was hopeful. I, I mean, I was a little nervous, of course, um, because it's it's so important to me. You know, I, it's like my baby's out there, um, but they they love it. You know, so that's that's wonderful. Even in the midst of a pandemic. God is binding us together in new ways. People seem so connected to God as they express their praise with their, with their, with their hands. And it, it's another way to worship God in another language. And it helps us to feel like we don't have to be held down by this pandemic. There, we can still continue to praise the Lord in the middle of, of what's going on in the world. I have worked in the industry, the nonprofit industry, helping people experiencing homelessness. And I've seen a lot of people in the Denver metro area that are actually um, living and sleeping in their car. And they would come in and say, I'm sleeping in my car. I don't have any place to go to the bathroom. I don't have any place to shower. I, I can't, they keep waking me up all night long. The police wake me up and they tell me to move along because it's illegal to sleep in your car. So Rochelle Brogan, a deacon and board chair of the Prince of Peace congregation in Littleton, Colorado, decided to do something about that. She'd heard of a program in California that arranged for churches and nonprofits to allow people living in their cars to spend the night in their parking lot. I thought, wow, that's a great idea. Um, you're using parking lot that nobody's using at night. Um, it's, it helps people to be together and, and get off the street and it helps them to be safe. And so I just started talking to people and we started the Colorado Safe Parking Initiative. And that's our mission is to set up safe parking locations. We have a beautiful parking lot, safe neighborhood where it's very quiet and people could come and and park in, and and the church could be a supportive service for them. The local government in Littleton has not yet granted permission for the Prince of Peace property to be used for safe parking, but others across the Denver suburban area have, and the impact on those who sign up for the program is significant. One participant told a Denver TV station that safe parking means less stress. We sleep so much better at night because we don't have to worry about anybody knocking on our window, someone telling us we have to move or, you know, anything like that. So it's just like, it's secure. It feels nice to be safe. The first lot we had in um, Longmont, the church has been totally supportive and they've opened their building up, their fellowship hall. And so the people that park there can even take a shower and they provide dinner and coffee in the morning and donuts and just totally supportive and wonderful. The really sad thing is that right now, because of the pandemic um, and 
people losing their jobs and not being able to pay rent. The homelessness is a real it's a problem. scourge, and it's all over the country. Rochelle says the people who have a safe place to stay are more likely to be able to find a job and get back on their feet, especially if they know that someone cares about them. You're comfortable, you're happy, you feel like you belong somewhere, which I think is like my biggest thing. I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere because I didn't have a house. There's one lady that asked me about my son all the time, and you can't, you don't get that sleeping in a Walmart parking lot. You don't get people that really care about you and that show you that they care, and these guys do. Our mission, our, our directive from Jesus was to help your neighbor, to be a good Samaritan, and to look out for each other. The Prince of Peace congregation believes responding to the needs of their neighbors is part of what it means to be Jesus in the neighborhood. That which is unfamiliar and strange and outside of our comfort zone can become habit, routine, familiar with just a bit of courage. And that is true with our practices as well as with our people. We become strangers no more. A beloved hymn among many of the brethren, one that Almost didn't make it into the hymnal. When it came time to choose hymns for the 1992 hymnal, the Mennonites and the Brethren had a lot of negotiating to do. The Mennonites had their very favorite hymns. And of course, we Brethren had our very favorite hymns, especially hymns that were by our poet laureate. Yes, we loved anything that Kenneth Morse had written. Now, the Mennonites weren't as sure about this hymn as we brethren were. Of course, we had known it for 20 years. We had sung it together in our churches that had the songbook, and we had sung it at annual conference. For the Mennonites, it seemed terribly new, not that we weren't putting new hymns in the hymnal, but this one maybe to the Mennonites seemed a bit humanistic. They maybe thought that um, it was not sophisticated enough. And it was maybe the words God and uh, Jesus Christ, maybe... Um, it was more implicit than explicit. And so we brethren pushed for it, and we pushed hard, and it came out on page 322, and to this day is loved. And in some ways, it's more important in today's world than it ever has been before. It incorporates the values that are so important to us as people. The values we have of the variety of members, the conservatives and the liberals and the moderates, the black, white, yellow, brown, our Nigerian sisters and brothers who are so important to us. For we are strangers no more, but members of one family. Strangers no more, but part of one humanity. Strangers no more, we're neighbors to each other now. Strangers no more, we're sisters and we're brothers now.
in our time together, we're discovering what it means to venture forth boldly, to be innovative and earnest as we search the scriptures for what God desires of us. In the African country of Uganda, about two years ago, there was a pastor who was searching not only the scriptures, but also the internet. He had never heard of the Church of the Brethren until he came upon the brethren.org website. Hello, everyone. This is our Pastor Bombali Sedrak is convinced that God led him to the Church of the Brethren website during a pivotal time in his spiritual journey. I had, had no connection in any way with anyone in the U.S. or anyone in Africa that was a member of the Church of the Brethren. What I liked most when I saw it is the, uh, the statement that I came across, which was saying that the Church of the Brethren has no creed but the New Testament, meaning that the New Testament was the creed for the Church of the Brethren. Pastor Sedrak and members of his family at the time were embroiled in a dispute with the Pentecostal church he was a part of over their insistence that salvation only comes through speaking in tongues. We tried to search the scripture. We could not find a proof to that. What they found in the Church of the Brethren was an emphasis on peace. In a country embroiled by conflict, he was amazed that there was a church out there that proclaimed that all war is sin. Believing in the peace and non-violence, I realized that this was the right, I was in the right place. He was also impressed by the belief that all people are individually and wonderfully made in the image of God, that Jesus' love encompasses all people, and the church exists to share that saving love. We agreed to form a church and associate the church with the doctrine of the Church of the Brethren. He started two churches in the Kampala area and introduced this approach to faith to his uncle, a pastor in the rural area of western Uganda, where there are now five additional congregations that call themselves Church of the Brethren. One of them in the village of Kendahai is pastored by two women. Through a Facebook connection with Larry Dittmers in the U.S., Cedric shared his vision for the church in Uganda with Gordon Hoffert, a Brethren minister who happened to be visiting in Uganda in 2019. Each church leads people to Christ and nurtures its members, but that is not the sole focus of their existence. The congregation in Kampala, Gordon says, has a heart for the most vulnerable members of their society and started an orphanage in their community, with almost 80 children now in their care. And the church in Bigando has turned the village school in that community into a Church of the Brethren ministry. Pastor Cedric says they need resources to offer more theological training for their church leaders and would like to acquire land so that the orphanage can become self-sustaining. Because we would like to engage in farming, but what is hindering farming uh, is lack of land. Hmm. Once we have land, then I believe that we shall be able to become self-sustainable because we have members who are willing to offer labor uh, so that we can be able to be self-sustaining. In the meantime, as the Ugandan brethren share the love of God in their community, they rejoice in the partnership with their brothers and sisters across the Church of the Brethren, a faith tradition they say is consistent with their understanding of Scripture, and one that they discovered with a little help from the Internet. Our support and love for one another amidst a national landscape of loss, fear, injustice, and conflict has had to change. In place of a hug, an email. In place of a potluck, a warm meal delivered to a neighbor's porch. We create cards to send to one another, poems to share our emotions and convictions, videos to worship or to call folks to action social media support in the form of prayers, live streams, and posts. As we come to God in prayer, I give thanks for the many creative ways that my family and I have felt the support of the church and of our family and friends. We all have stories of loss, fear, love, and support from this past year. God is with you, and our prayers are with you. Will you pray with me? 
God of the journey. A long and challenging road has brought us to this day and through this year. Your earth and your people are crying out for justice, love, health, and support. May we hear their cry. Loving God, we know that you love us. Reveal to us your spirit. May our eyes see your kingdom here on earth. May our ears hear the cries of our neighbors who need our bold action to advocate for and support them. May our hearts be open to creating innovative ways to step forward in love of God and God's creation. As we follow you, our God who makes all things new, may we not be silent in our love. May we not be silent in our support. May we not be silent in our creativity. And may the divine spark within all of us and the light of God in our church shine brightly for all to see. Amen. In the Church of the Brethren, we have a long history of supporting one another and caring for our communities, especially in times of need. In these moments, we have the opportunity to give, to give an offering to the Emergency Disaster Fund and to the Annual Conference Office. The ways to do that have appeared on your screen. Because of the pandemic, our districts have not been able to hold their normal auctions that would be the bulk of the funding for the Emergency Disaster Fund. And the Annual Conference Office has had to take on additional expenses in order to provide a virtual conference this summer. This is an opportunity for us to support and uphold these important ministries. The theme for this worship service has been venture forth boldly as a faith family, expectant and innovative, serving others and the God who makes all things new. Those words were written as part of the interpretation of the compelling vision, but they could have been written for the church in the midst of the pandemic. Because this last year has pushed us to venture less timidly and more boldly. The pandemic has pushed us in terms of expectation and innovation, pushed us to wrap our arms around the phrase, all things new. One of the ways the pandemic has pushed us is to not take each other for granted and to not take for granted our familiar ways of doing things. The very real threat of the coronavirus has done that. Being deprived of each other's face-to-face -face company, being deprived of familiar routines has done that to us in the church. Maybe we have learned not to take youth work projects and church conferences and pastoral visits in the local retirement community for granted anymore. Maybe we don't take our opportunities to simply cross paths with our brothers and sisters on Sunday morning or our rituals of grief for granted anymore. And the experiences of this past year have made us more aware of the fragility of life and its routines and the importance of this particular moment. As we venture forth from this time, what will you no longer take for granted? And of course, the pandemic has forced us to be more creative and more flexible. Maybe it's made us less lazy. Online worship is a big example of that. We have to think about every little detail. We have to be creative in finding ways to include children and youth when they are already tired of being online. We have to find new ways to sing and share music. And it's not just worship, but we've had to innovate in terms of congregational life. All last year, like many of you in my congregation, we were constantly thinking about new versions of familiar activities as well as entirely new ministries that would allow us to engage, but safely. We took our planned outdoor Sing Me Home Festival online. We had a Guide My Feet bike rodeo for kids. We rented the local drive-in movie theater to show a movie with an anti-racism theme. We offered ourselves as a host site for our Second Harvest tailgate food distributions. And when winter came, we needed a whole different set of ideas. Spontaneous sledding parties, offering the church gym to families in one-hour slots on a Sunday afternoon, more Zoom opportunities for study, for games, for conversation. Every time we did something new, we asked ourselves this question. And what is next? So what new thing, what innovation is next for you? 
And the pandemic has encouraged us to expand the circle of community. People worship with my congregation now from places all over the country and indeed from other places around the world. When we go back to in-person worship, like many of you, we will have to continue to live stream our worship services because our congregation is now not only local, it's translocal. We are continually weaving a new web of connection. In our local community, we've connected with people who would have hesitated to come in person before because of the spotlight that shines on someone who comes to visit a church in a small town. But now they've gotten to know us. And there are people who worship with us, but who also regularly worship with other brethren congregations online. And those folks share ideas and suggestions with us from what others of you are doing. And there's this possibility of cross-fertilization. All those connections are changing us and sometimes challenging us. How is your circle of community expanding? And how is that expansion changing the family of faith? And finally, the pandemic, the experience of this last year has sharpened our awareness of our witness. What does it mean to engage the world, to go beyond the walls? A lot of what we assumed about what the church can do and how it should and will function has now been blown away. And in the online world, we have discovered anew the truth that we are not in control of our exposure, who sees us, what they think of us. So all we can do is focus on making sure that what we say and what we do all stays true to who we are, who Jesus is calling us to be. What is new and renewed about your witness in Christ? When this period of time is over, will we go back to what was? Will we let go of the new and go back to the old? I guess the answer is yes and no. Yes, we will travel back to some of the things we were forced to leave behind in the last year. Because, for example, there's no substitute for being with each other physically. There's no substitute for holding a hand, singing together, having hands-on educational opportunities, doing physical acts of help and charity. We will want and need to be back together. But no, we won't go back to what was in the sense that we can ever retreat back into the small and rigid spaces we were occupying. The circle of the church is and must continue to be bigger now. The walls have opened up. Technology has expanded our reach and our responsibility. Like you, I look forward to coming out the other end of this tunnel. But what is at the other end is different than where we were last March. Will we venture forth boldly? Will we continue in a spirit and practice of expectation and innovation? Will we see with fresh eyes and continue to embrace fresh ideas of how to carry forward our mission of serving others and serving the God who makes all things new? Even as this last year has been a hard time for the church, this has also become our time of imagination and opportunity. May we live into this new day with hope and trust, with openness and creativity, with wonder and grace and love. For God is making all things new. Amen. Sisters, brothers, siblings in faith, thank you for welcoming us into your homes and into your lives, for joining and sharing together in ours. Sharing with you our family of faith has been a gift to us. May we all continue to know the blessing of God's renewing love with us and for us. And may we continue to have the boldness to share it. Amen. Guide my feet while I run this race, my Lord, guide my feet. While I run this race, my Lord, guide my feet. While I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Race in vain, I said, now hold my hand. While I run this race, my Lord, hold my hand. While I run this race, yes, my Lord, hold my hand. 
while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain, race in vain, I said, now I'm your child, while I run this race, I'm your child, while I run this race, While I run this race, my Lord, search my heart. While I run this race, my Lord, search my heart. While I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Race in vain, I said, now guide my feet. While I run this race, guide my feet. While I run this race, guide my feet. While I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Race in.